It's not often that I do stories about uh, religious possessions and exorcisms, so it was really nice for a change to get my teeth well and truly sunk into this one. Now, you can probably have some idea of where it's going to go from the title, but it leads you off into some unknown places, so it definitely is well worth a listen. Another fantastic story here from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. So, my dear friends, I think you know what to do. Once again, it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. My name is Jamie. I'm a kid's pastor at a small, non-denominational church in rural New Mexico. I'm 35 years old, and last winter, I exorcised one of the most powerful demons in existence out of the Antichrist. Yet he will return one day to bring destruction to the earth in ways never seen before. I work at a small church on the outskirts of Roswell. Like I said, it's a non-denominational church, pretty similar to the modern megachurches, just slimmed down in size. I really enjoy my work. I love serving the kids and the Lord in my position. It's humble doesn't pay much. I actually work a second part-time job at Starbucks to help pay the bills with my roommate Amanda. We have services on Sundays and Wednesdays, and then various other activities the rest of the week. We're very service-minded toward the community and the less fortunate. We do a free community breakfast on Saturday mornings that I head up in the poorest district in the city. Wednesday night is our youth church night. I usually have about 30 kiddos on any given Sunday, and about half that on Wednesdays. The church is just off Highway 285, north of Roswell. The building is a newer, somewhat industrial-looking building in the shape of a giant cube, two stories high. It was a converted warehouse the church bought a couple of years ago when they moved buildings. The kids' church is on the second floor. Below the kids' church area, on the first floor, is the common room, a cafe, entryway, kitchen, and offices, and then the rest of the building space is dedicated to the auditorium. It's a nice church. Humble, not extravagant, but modern and good. And pretty artsy. We have a lot of artists that attend church here, and they donate some of their pieces to the church. It's all quite lovely. Well, it happened on a Wednesday night last month. A week before Thanksgiving in November, I'd just gotten off my first shift at Starbucks. I made myself a venti four-shot Americano before leaving. A brutal Arctic cold front had just come in. We were under a blizzard warning from the National Weather Service for the next two days. We were going to get almost 18 inches of snow, which is really mind-blowing. It wasn't going to hit until overnight, so we were all still planning on having Wednesday night service. I hung up my black apron in the back, wrapped myself up in my pink camo coat and my scarf, and stepped out into the frigid New Mexican night with my hot coffee the steam wafting up to my chilled nose. The wind had started blowing like crazy out of the north. The night was dark, save for the parking lights overhead and the city lights in the background. I hopped into my little Nissan, turned the ignition, and cranked the heater up. I took the lid off of my coffee for a second and let the steam warm up my face. I looked into the rearview mirror. Now I'd spent most of my life alone, a lone woman of the Lord, faithful to the calling and loving my neighbor. Deep down in my heart, I wanted to live that white picket fence home life with a family to come home to, a husband who loved me, children who called me mum. But as the days wore on, I saw the dream slipping further away. I thought I looked pretty. I'd put a slight curl in my blonde hair for today and stayed rather fit, but, well... If I was called to live a life alone, so be it. American culture sometimes sees women as weak, depending on men for everything. <laughs> ah, I'm not weak. I'm strong. Deep in my heart, I know I'm a warrior princess. I drove off down 285 and came up to the church. I saw several of the regulars' cars parked out front. I saw a couple of new ones, too. Light crowd for tonight, though. 
which I expected, given the impending snow apocalypse. I hopped out and went inside. I greeted several people in the main hall, and then went up to the kids' church. No one was there. Not surprising. I decided I'd hang out and get some work done on Sunday's material if no one ever showed up, then go downstairs and see if the other pastors or the prayer team needed help. It was 30 minutes into when service had started, and I was still alone. I was sitting on the side of the stage, working on Sunday's message, when I realized I was not alone. I looked up, and was startled to see a girl standing just inside the doors from the landing and staircase outside the kids' church auditorium. She was a teenager, maybe 15 or so, dark brunette hair and a complexion that gave her away as probably Portuguese or Spanish. She was wrapped up in a dark coat, a face that was blank, but I couldn't help but get the feeling this was a mask for something more troubling. Regardless, I thought a cheery attitude might be the best way for me to approach her. Hi, I called to her. She didn't say anything at first, but stepped forward toward me. She came up to me and said, Hello. Her accent gave her away as Portuguese. My name's Jamie. I'm the pastor. What's your name? My name is Gabby, the girl replied. I stared into her soft brown eyes. And yes, she is terrified, I thought to myself. Oh, it's nice to meet you, Gabby. Well, as you can see, no one really showed up tonight, so we're probably not going to do much. We can talk, though, if you'd like. She stuttered, and for a moment held my gaze, as if she were trying to ascertain if I was a safe place or not. She opened her mouth as if she were about to say something, and then... Gabby! A voice shot out in the silence. We both looked over to the door where a girl stood in the doorway. She was older than Gabby, maybe about twenty. Light hair like mine, and her face was stern. Her eyes fixated upon Gabby as if Gabby were in trouble. As if Gabby had done something wrong and she knew it. I got a feeling of an evil presence with this girl. Couldn't put my finger on it, but... It was like I was standing on the precipice of an abyss of evil when I looked at her. Gabby looked back into my eyes for a moment, and then back at the other girl. Just for a moment, her face betrayed the facade and gave away an S.O.S. And then she walked toward the other girl without a word or glance back to me. The two walked out, and I was left alone. Well, I couldn't just sit there. Everything inside me told me something was desperately wrong with this girl. She was in pain. Something was happening to her. Something terrible. I got up and walked intently to the staircase. It was empty. I walked down the stairs to the atrium below. I opened the door to see the two girls standing with a man. He was taller, maybe six foot one, with short, dark hair. He was wearing a slim leather jacket that came down past his waist. He looked wealthy upon first glance. He was quite attractive. The older girl was talking with him. They were unaware of my presence, so I waited and listened. It's not on the walls. Where is it, goddess? The man said to the girl. It's hidden in their storage closet. Her voice had turned demonic. She walked past him and snapped at the other girl. They both followed and walked out of my sight as they went into the auditorium. Something was going wrong. I didn't understand what it was, but something evil was happening. I felt it in my spirit. I stepped out of the stairwell and decided to walk to the kitchen. I wanted to find one of the other pastors, and I typically could find one in the kitchen or back office area. I walked into the kitchen. The lights were on, brightly illuminating the room. There was blood smeared in long trails across the floor, across the walls, across the ceilings. Body parts had been obviously flung across the room with various heads, shoulders, legs, stomachs, torsos, and other parts lying around. 
Long human veins had been stretched out across one wall in an erratic fractal pattern. In the sink were human heads, hollowed out. I recognized the remains of some of my fellow church members. God, I threw up. The smell was horrendous. It was a slaughterhouse. I started crying. This was my community, my friends, my spiritual brothers and sisters. And they were all dead. I backed out of the room. I was about to run through the front doors, but something stopped me. Gabby. I heard a whisper in my ear. I whipped around to see John, our head pastor. Dead, but here he was. Not dead. His eyes met mine. They burned almost as with fire. Save her, he said firmly, and then he disappeared, as if he was never there in the first place. I swallowed hard, and then, with a face of determination, turned round. I was going to save her. I silently moved to the door of the auditorium. They were inside. I could see them in between the crack of the double doors. They were on the stage. Gabby was holding a tall painting, her front facing toward me. The other two were opposite her with their backs to me. They were levitating off the ground, about three feet in the air. It was terrifying. It was like watching a witch in mid-air. I listened in. This is it! exclaimed the man. The girl nodded to him. I hadn't seen this painting exhibited in our church yet. It was striking, about five feet tall by three feet wide. It was a smoky piano barroom scene set somewhere from maybe the 1930s. It was dark. There were people in fedoras sitting around listening to a jazz band on stage, men in dressy suits smoking cigarettes, Women in little black dresses and high heels. It was definitely a mashup of current culture dress and early 20th century clothing. On the back wall behind the band was a crucifix. It was a lush and gorgeous painting. I honestly couldn't understand why they were interested in it. Take it to the car, the girl said to Gabby. Your voice sounding more like a man's voice. Gabby picked it up the weight of it causing her to arch her back to balance herself as she walked down the steps of the stage. I quickly backed away from the door to not be seen and ran back to the stairwell. I held my breath. It was the longest minute of silence before I heard the anticipated steps of Gabby as she walked by. My heart, oh, my heart was aching for her. She was innocent, a girl trapped in a dungeon of evil. I held my breath still, waiting for the other two. I looked through the crack in the door as the man and the other girl floated by. The girl's face now looked twisted and was no longer that of a young woman. Not human. As if a human face had been twisted and distorted in a mirror. I heard the front doors open and close, and ventured, with the three of them outside, it was now safe to come out. I stepped out and ran to the front window and peeked through the curtains to see. My heart followed after Gabby. Gabby was loading the painting into the back of a Mercedes Sprinter van. She then opened the side back door. The Twister girl came over and took out a leash and collar, placed the collar on the girl, kicked her in the stomach, put her hand up, and the girl flew back into the van, as if some invisible force had thrown her inward. Then she and the man got into the driver and front passenger seats. The van pulled out of the parking lot and on to 285, heading north out of town into the dark New Mexican night. I threw open the door and ran to my little car, flipped the key and turned the engine on and swung out of the parking lot, praying I wouldn't lose sight of them as I got onto the highway to follow them. I kept my headlights off and accelerated up to 70 miles an hour. 
I could see the van, the two red taillights like demons' eyes in the night. The sky was abysmal, with only the faint city lights revealing the dark clouds above, portending a blizzard soon to come. There was no other traffic on the highway, which meant I could safely stay under the radar as I followed. The van kept going north. I hadn't been able to process all that had just happened. The questions of who they were, what was going on, why the painting, and a million others were being suppressed by my brain. In lieu of reconciling reality to reason, I was running off adrenaline and the unswerving belief that God wanted me to rescue this girl. And so, I followed, deeper and deeper into the night. Eventually, the trail led me to the small town of Vaughan, where 285 abruptly turns west. The van, however, turned southwestward onto Highway 54. The wind was blowing so hard it pushed my little car towards the edge of the highway and its most potent gusts. Small flakes of snow were starting to fall, in ever-increasing increments, foreshadowing an impending whiteout. The van continued onward ahead of me. I approached the ghost town of Duran, and as we left it, I noticed the van ahead of me start to slow down and eventually turn off the highway to the right and went west into a field. I slowed my car as well. I watched as the van drove across a field up to a mesa. The snow was now starting to fall heavily. I was having to see through a squinted view of the field and mesa. The van parked close to the mesa off the highway. I could make out several other cars next to it, but then I lost sight of it. I stopped next to where the van had pulled off. There was a dirt road next to the highway that led off toward the mesa. I knew a confrontation was imminent if I turned off the road here. I could always just go back home and call the police and let this be done. But I knew the police couldn't handle this. This was spiritual, and I am a warrior. It was my duty to go in, and so I did. The road was very bumpy, and it rattled my car each pothole that I hit. The dirt road below was becoming filled over with dark snow. I could barely see where I was going, and could barely see the road. I kept a straight eastward path having guesstimated it was about a quarter mile off the highway where they'd parked. I finally decided to stop the car, as I didn't want to park too close. As I got out, I could see the cars down a slight hill in front of me. I walked toward them, not knowing what to expect. I was praying under my icy breath the entire time. As I came up, I saw all the lights off, and tracks in the fresh snow leading away toward the Mesa. The cars were very expensive. There were two Bentleys, a Lamborghini, a couple Mercedes, a BMW. God, what is this? My mind cried out. I looked up at the Mesa. I could see, very faintly, movement along the side on a cliff. Then, a dark hole or entrance next to it. I saw the movements disappear into the black hole, or the opening. I knew that was where I must go. The blizzard was hitting now. I was terribly cold. I wanted to cry, but I couldn't. Not yet. I slipped in the snow and hit the ground. I pulled back up and kept going. I could barely see my hands in front of my face. I was scared. I reached the base of the mesa and started looking for a way up to the entrance. It was about a 30 degree climb up over rocks. No path existed, at least none that I could make out given the current lighting and weather. I kept going. The wind ripped into my coat. My skin felt frozen underneath. It took at least 30 minutes to get up to the altitude of the entrance. I could see it now for there was a faint light coming from out of the entrance. There was a small path along the side wall of the mesa that led to the entrance. 
I followed it with my back up against the Mesa wall, praying I wouldn't slip on the snow and, and fall to my death off the side. I moved up to the entrance. I could feel a blast of heat coming from inside, which, by the time I was right outside, my body was starting to warm up. But it was an unnatural, terrible heat. I would have preferred to freeze in the snow than to feel that heat on me. The entrance led to a small walkway that led underground into the interior parts of the mesa. I started walking down it. I wasn't concerned about my footsteps giving off a sound as the wind blew so hard as to mask my presence. I walked deeper and deeper. It got warmer and warmer. I found my body sweating underneath my coat and shirt. The light was a dim light that got brighter and brighter the deeper I went. The smell became humid, and a stench of sweat filled the air. The walkway made an abrupt, sharp descent. I stopped at the top, because I could see them all below me, where the walkway opened to a moderately large room dug out of the rock. I crouched low to the floor an inch downward so I could see what was happening inside. There was a blazing fire along one rock wall. The man was standing on a podium of sorts in front of it. He was wearing a white robe. Next to him, on his right, was the girl, who now looked like a man, still twisted in appearance in its face. The eyes, oh my, it took my breath away. On his left was a man dressed in papal attire. He seemed to be leading worship of the man in the white robe. In front of the three were ten men kneeling, prostrate before them in reverence and worship. They were wealthy. Most were wearing business casual clothes. A pile of coats was in the back behind them. They looked to be a blend of European men, some southerly and some northerly, middle-aged at youngest. Off to their left, I could see a huddled group of four women sitting on the ground. They looked absolutely terrified and were trying to comfort each other. They were barely clothed and looked as if they'd been beaten, maybe worse. The women were mostly in their twenties, maybe thirties. There was an air of fear I'd never felt before in that room. The man began speaking to the group. I am your God. The man responded, You are our God. We have thwarted Jehovah's plan to keep us from rising before Apollyon was thrown into the abyss, as it is written in the Bible. He motioned to the person standing next to him, the twisted girl as Apollyon. Our power is consolidated. We will now begin the takeover. War will begin. The slaughter will commence. And while we eat the earth, soon Lucifer will destroy Michael and the angels and cast Jehovah out of heaven. Heaven and earth will be ours. We are on the edge of winning a war that started many ages ago. We lost the first battle, but we'll win the war. The kneeling men began to worship him. This man was the Antichrist. Apollyon was next to him. The other man must have been the false prophet. After worshipping, the false prophet called out, Jehovah created Eve as the pinnacle of creation, the very image of his beauty. We will now sacrifice that beauty to our true God's glory. He stretched his arm out toward the women, and an invisible force seemed to push the women toward him. Apollyon reached into his coat and pulled out a long knife. The women were forced down onto their knees in front of the Antichrist. Oh, I couldn't let this happen. I felt a force inside of me kick in, and as if I were out of control of my body, I ran down into the room. They all turned around when I entered. I noticed the couple of other things in the room when I came in. The painting was on the wall to my left, next to the entrance, facing the Antichrist. An unearthly luminescence came out of it, 
off the colours toward the group. Sitting on the ground in chains was Gabby. I screamed as loud as I could. In the name of Christ, you were commanded to set these women free and go to the abyss. The fire went out and the room went black. The ground tipped back toward the back wall, toward the painting. I lost my footing, as did everyone else, and I fell. I fell toward Gabby and landed hard on the ground. I grabbed her into my arms and then lurched toward where I thought the entrance was, only to find myself smash into the painting. And the darkness covered us until I woke. I was driving. I was driving in a car. It was a Lamborghini. Everything was in black and white, as in an old film. The top was down, and the air felt warm and gorgeous. The road was flying by underneath me as the Lambo's engine screamed. There were palm trees lining the side of the road. I went into a dark tunnel and emerged the other side. There were buildings, apartments, more palms. It was reminiscent of L.A., but I couldn't be sure that's where I was at the moment. I was driving, and I knew where I was going somehow, even though I didn't. I made a turn onto a street and wound up at the front of a hotel. It was a gorgeous property. Palms everywhere. To my left was the ocean. I pulled up to the front for the valet and got out. Other cars were parked with their occupants entering and exiting, coming and going. The cars were either old and very nice, or new and very nice. No middle ground. There was a fireplace burning in the wall beside the entrance doors. I walked inside to a lush, gorgeous lobby. The people inside were dressed up. Suits, beautiful dresses. It seemed this type of attire was the norm. I found the ladies' room and went in to see my reflection. No one else was inside. I looked at myself in the mirror on the wall and noticed I was dressed appropriately in a short, lovely black dress with a diamond necklace on. I felt something strapped to my leg just above my knee under my dress. I reached down to pull out a hidden gun. It was loaded. I took a long look at it feeling the cold metal against my warm skin. It was then that everything came back to me. Why I was here. I'd forgotten, and as if when someone becomes lucid in a dream and suddenly remembers there is a whole world out there beyond this reality, so I remembered. I was there to find two murderers. They were on the loose. Two men. I couldn't remember their names. There had been a string of murders at the hotel, but no one could discover who was committing the crimes. So I had been called in as a private investigator. I came out of the ladies' room and entered back into the lobby. To my right was the elevator bank leading up into the rooms. To my left was a hallway leading to a restaurant and apparently some type of bar with jazz music wafting out of it. I wasn't sure what to do next. I knew somehow that the murderers were here, in the hotel, and they weren't leaving. I had an awful dread that a new murder would happen very soon if I didn't find them. I decided to go to the front desk and ask for the manager. The receptionist nodded to me at my request and disappeared behind a door, apparently to an office area. A moment later, a middle-aged, portly, bald man in a polo and khakis came out to meet me. How can I help you? His accent was thick, as from the US East Coast, probably New York. Hi, I'm here to investigate the murders. Do you have any information on what has happened? Any suspects? His face turned to stone and almost became trance-like. After a few seconds, he came out of it, looked around to make sure no one was listening in, and then motioned for me to follow him in through the back door. I entered a long, dark hallway, which led into a kitchenette, probably the staff break room. He looked at me again. Hold your nose. I did as he asked. He opened up the fridge to reveal human corpses all pushed up against each other. 
they had been dismembered. The heads had been hollowed out. Veins had been piled up like stringy innards removed from an autumn gourd prior to baking. I gasped and had the strongest deja vu passed me by in that instant. Pretty bad, huh? He remarked, shutting the door. Well, that was earlier this evening. Found the remains all over the kitchen here. I recognized some of the bodies as current guests. Never heard anything. No one saw anything. Called the cops an hour ago, but they said you was coming, so I just put everything in here. I backed off a few steps my stomach filling with horror and dread. I was living a black and white horror film. Any evidence left behind? I asked. None, but I have a feeling you should check into room 3366. Two men checked in there earlier this week, right before this all started. They're the only ones I can tag to the string of murders. I've gone all over the records and security tapes of the guests the past week, and they always seem to be nearby before a murder began. Here's a copy of their room key, if you want it. He handed me the key. I nodded in agreement and followed him out of the break room and back to the lobby. It looked like the lights had dimmed in the hotel. There were more guests as well. It was a packed night, and smoke hung in the air. As I walked up to the elevator bank and pressed the up button, I noticed a man standing in the crowd. He noticed me. His eyes. I felt the dread. He turned and disappeared into the crowd, and I lost him. The elevator dinged, and the doors opened. I went in and hit the button for the 33rd floor. The doors opened a moment later, and I emerged onto a retro-themed floor. Retro for 2019, that is started counting down the room numbers on the doors until I reached 3366. I knocked first and then waited. No answer. Knocked again, then waited. Comfortable that no one was at home, I slid the key into the door and went in. The room was a suite overlooking the ocean. No lights were on. The sun setting over the ocean illuminated much of the room. I flipped on the lamp next to the bed and started looking around. Two bags of luggage were in the corner. My heart was pounding in my chest. I put the luggage on a corner desk. It was a combination suitcase. I couldn't open it. Might not be worth my time, I thought. I went into the bathroom. Nothing. I went into the adjoining bedroom. Empty. I opened the closet door in the adjoining bedroom and there was a woman, bound and gagged, lying on the floor. She was moving her head, trying to see me. It's okay, I whispered. I'm here to rescue you. I took off the gag. She looked about my age. Quite beautiful. Looked ragged like she'd been mistreated. How badly, I couldn't tell. She was also wearing an evening gown, which told me she was potentially part of the party going on down in the lobby in the bar. Thank you. She replied as I pulled the rope off her hands. She looked at me. What's your name? Jamie. Uh, I'm Evie. Who did this to you? Apollyon and the Antichrist. What? I exclaimed, the dread now deeper than ever. Uh, They want to kill everyone in the hotel. They will. We need to leave here. We need to get out of here. They're going to kill everyone tonight. At the party? I ask. Yes. They went downstairs. They have automatic guns. They're going to kill everyone. There's some women I'm traveling with. They're going to kill them too. They hate us. What are you talking about? How do they know you? From where and when? From a long time ago. (laughs) She started to sob quietly. I helped her up to her feet. She had a limp and a bad bruise on her heel from a beating they'd given her. I looked out for a moment, out the window. The scene was still black and white, but the ocean looked different. It looked like a void, chaotic and terrible. Like the abyss. 
it gave me goosebumps. Let's call the police and then find your friends, I say, walking over to the phone. I pick it up and dial 911. An automated recording came on, saying on repeat, I'm sorry, but the number you are dialing does not exist. Please try again. I'm sorry, but the number you are dialing does not exist. Please try again. There's no one to help us from them, Evie whispers. No one's available to help because help doesn't exist. Her voice trailing off into a tone of nihilistic dread. We have to find your friends, I say, with an urgency blossoming from a new existential panic rising within me. We hurry to the door and step back into the hallway. They're hiding somewhere. I don't know. Would they be downstairs in the lobby? No. Evie shook her head. That's where the murderers are. They don't know we know about them. Or maybe they do. We hurried back to the elevator bank. Before we could hit the button, it dinged. We both took a step back. Terrified it was the two evil men. Not so, to our relief. A woman stepped out. She had dark, flowing hair, beautiful in appearance as well. She looked dark in complexion, maybe Middle Eastern. Evie's face lit up. Mary, where have you been? Evie asked in wonder. I surmised this was one of Evie's companions. Hiding. I called for help. My son's driving over now to help us get out of here and rescue us. They're downstairs. They're executing everyone. We have to get down there. Maybe we can stop them. Evie stepped back, afraid. Mary motioned for us to get into the elevator. I can't. I can't face them, Evie said. Mary turned around to face her. Evie, we have to stop them. Everyone is dying. Evie shook her head, no. Mary stepped close to her, put her hands on her shoulders and gazed into her eyes. Hey, she said softly, brushing a strand of Evie's hair back over her neck. It's okay. My son is coming. He can kill them, don't worry. But they beat me. Evie sobbed. They ripped my coat off and beat me behind the hotel. They must have been watching me from above the hotel walls. They hurt me. I don't ever want to see them again. Mary started to cry silently with Evie. Trust me, it will be different this time, Mary whispered. She kissed her cheek gently and led her into the elevator with a hand on her back. As the elevator descended, I reached down to my thigh under my dress and pulled out the gun. I held it tightly in my hand. Ding! The elevator stopped at the lobby. The doors opened. The lobby was a massacre. All of the life I'd seen earlier was gone. Dead bodies covered most of the floor. Blood smeared on the walls. Body parts, limbs everywhere. Several people were hanging from the ceiling, dismembered with entrails hanging out onto the floor. I heard one sound. It was coming from the jazz bar. A scream and a shot and another shot. A man was begging for his life. We crept closer, stepping on human remains as we went. I couldn't process the carnage around me. Huge pools of blood sat in the lobby carpet, wetting my heels. We stepped up close enough to see inside. There was a line of people off to one side. And the Antichrist had a gun and was shooting people execution style on the stage. Evie recognized her other girlfriends in the group. They were next. Mary shook her head and walked past us straight into the room. I found you, Mary called. The Antichrist turned around and looked at her. Apollyon was over next to the group of people waiting to die. They all die, Apollyon said, his voice sounding horrific. You die, Mary said, her voice filled with rage. I screamed and ran into the room, my gun aimed at Apollyon. Evie screamed in terror. I unloaded the bullets on him, 
They bounced off his suit and face. I loaded my only other clip in and turned to the Antichrist. But somehow he disappeared and then reappeared right in front of me. He smashed me in the face, blood flying into my eyes, and the gun went flying. I hit the table and slammed into the ground. I was about to catch my breath and jump for the gun when a girl ran into the room and picked it up. It was Gabby. She aimed and fired right into the Antichrist's forehead. Brain matter, skull fragments and blood exploded out of the back of his head. He fell to his knees, lifeless. Apollyon ran over to catch his body. He swooped him up before he hit the ground. Then he flew out of the room. Mary and I ran after him, Evie staying behind aghast at what just happened. We ran behind him out of the front door. Somehow, the Antichrist was now walking with Apollyon's helm. A black limo pulled up and a driver with some strong accent, possibly Italian, hopped out, screaming for them to get in, and opened the back door and guided the Antichrist into the car. He slammed the door shut. Before Apollyon could get in too, Another car pulled up and a man jumped out. He attacked Apollyon, who immediately tried to run away. He beat him. Horribly. Right there. Mary watched and nodded in approval. Finally, after Apollyon had been beaten almost to death, the man grabbed Apollyon by the back of his hair and started dragging him away. He dragged him into the street, cars swerving not to hit them. I followed. I couldn't stop watching. He dragged him all the way to the adjacent beach, then threw him down and kicked him relentlessly. Apollyon threw up blood everywhere. His face was disfigured from the beating. Then he grabbed him again and walked him toward the black water. The man threw Apollyon in. He sank under the water, and then he was gone. I awoke. I was back in the cave in the mesa. Gabby was lying next to me. The other women, too. The fire was only smoldering, barely alive. We were alone. I crawled over to Gabby and helped her up, then helped up the other women. We all walked together, leaning on each other, holding each other up, as we got out of the caves and out into the blizzard. It was still night time. The cars were gone down below us. I expected that. We all got into my car, turned the lights on, cranked up the heater and started driving. We got on the highway and went back home. It's summertime now. It's hot outside. No more blizzards for now. I no longer make espresso and lattes. I'm the new women's pastor at our church. I'm a mum now too. I adopted Gabby. I'm driving home from church, back to my new house. A humble little cottage on a couple acres, just north of the church. I drive off the highway onto a dirt road, and then pull into my driveway. A couple of cars are parked in the driveway. I get out and go in the front door. Hey, Gabs, I call out. Hi, Mom. Appetizers are done, she calls from the kitchen. The other ladies are hanging out in the living room. I say hi to Evie and give Mary a hug as I go into the kitchen to grab some chips and guacamole. I run a homeless women's Bible study and support group now with Mary and Gabs. We started doing a lot of homeless ministry lately and even got a new safe house built for abused and homeless women. Some of the ladies who live there attend our group. As I sit down in the living room, I feel a depth of peace I've never felt before. One of the ladies asks, So, picking up from last week's study, I have a question. In Revelation, it says the beast out of the abyss will be released, and that the Antichrist will be healed from his head wound. How does that happen? I smile and slide the chip with guac into my mouth and nod to Mary.
So what did you think of that one? Definitely a case of, uh, that escalated way too quickly, I think. <laughs> and then it went off into a complete tangent towards the end. So quite a weird and wonderful story. Um, hope you didn't get too confused by the sudden change of setting. But uh, one that I really enjoyed. Well, I'll be back again next week with more delights from Dr. Creepin's Vault. And I do so hope you'll join me. You got over the new year? Of course you did. Now, back to work. And back with me on a regular basis, I hope. Well... Enough for one week. I will, of course, see you again on Monday. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay?